This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, our very special guest, Louis Leinhart. He is, among many other things, a preacher, and he's with the organization truthdefenders.com, and you can find him on 3rd Street Promenade in Santa Monica, preaching slash debating with Muslims and with leftists and with lots of people. Louis Leinhart, welcome to the Glasoff Gang. Thank you, Jamie. It's my pleasure. Fantastic to have you here, Lewis. Tonight, I want to discuss a Christian debating Muslims. I've been down on Third Street many times and watched you in action and watched everything that you're doing. You are quite a special person uh, involved in uh, quite a special mission and one could say also a dangerous mission. Um, let's begin just for our audience. Tell our viewers what exactly you do down on Third Street. Sure. Well, it's basically an open air uh, environment where there's a lot of there are, the city has an ordinance where they allow performers to use amplification. They have a lot of dancers, singers. Well, that allows for me to exercise my First Amendment and also use the types of equipment that the performers use, such as amplification. I have my laptop, such and so forth, some charts. And what it does is it attracts people. And I have a microphone set up for the audience to ask questions or make comments relating to any of the subject matter on my charts or anything they would like to discuss. And it usually gets into the discussion of politics and religion, which is what most people don't want to discuss, but uh, it, it does lead into that direction. But Lewis, one of your main themes is that you are a Christian preaching the message of Jesus Christ to people, and I would say especially to Muslims uh, in terms of what I've witnessed, and uh, you also make an attempt to convert Muslims, but you also uh, try to unveil, reveal, expose what you would say is the lie of Islam. Yeah, uh, I am a Christian, and my primary goal is to present the gospel to a non-Christian audience. Uh, with that comes the concept of apologetics. It's the Greek word apologion, which Paul used that word. It's in giving a defense. So when people come up and ask me questions, I need to be ready to give an answer when they question me. But at the same time, I do ask the audience questions, and it has gone more towards dealing with Muslims, not purposefully, but just because of the times we're living in, things that are on the news, the media, such and so forth, the uh, issues with the Middle East, the conflicts, that has brought the, uh, the question of Islam to the forefront in my ministry. And so I do deal with Islam quite a bit. So, Louis, what are two, three themes of yours about Islam, and what do they trigger uh, in terms of the Muslim response? Well, one of the charts that I've uh, came up with, uh, set up as PowerPoint, uh, is a chart that basically states these are facts about Islam that Muslims don't want you to know. And so it has bullet points and it deals with the nature of Islam, the character of Muhammad, the attributes of the God of Islam concerning his uh, goodness or lack of goodness, his justice or lack of justice, uh, his dealing with human beings such as with females, with children, uh, the concept of slavery, the concept of racism. So these are some of the points that I set up on my chart, and that will then lead to other questions. But I'm generally dealing with the either justice of the God of Islam or the injustices of the God of Islam, and that deals to a lot of other things. Okay, now get specific uh, with us. Uh, what do some of these bullet points say about Muhammad, his treatment of women, of slaves, of children, etc.? Well, sure. One of the points is that Muhammad engaged in pedophilia. And that leads to the question of one of his first wives, Aisha, who was six years old when he was engaged to her, and nine years old when they consummated the marriage. Muhammad was in his 50s at the time. Well, let me just say this, that, you know, there's a lot of people, and, you know, this is the reaction to you there, that you're saying something very bad and wrong and etc. But what you're saying, this is Islamically based. 
This is in the Hadith. This is in Islamic theology, correct? It's not just that you've thought this up and you're throwing some kind of insult at the Prophet Muhammad. This is in the texts. Right. I reference the primary source materials, which would be the Quran, the Hadith, the Sira literature, which is the biographies, the tafsirs, which are the commentaries of Islam or of the Quran by Muslim scholars. And I'm going back to the earlier sources, the most respected, most authoritative, so that it's not up for question anymore, although Muslims will question the information, either because of ignorance of their own subject matter or because of a, a desire to cover that truth. There is a doctrine within Islam that permits deception, and that is taqiyya, which is where they cover the truth, and the reasons might be varied. It could be because they want to deceive you. They're protecting themselves. They're protecting uh, Muhammad from uh, exposure of the reality that he was not a moral or just man. So I am referencing the most authoritative, most respected Muslim sources. Well, tell us uh, some of your experiences uh, what has happened in terms of the response here? Because I've been down there uh, numerous times and I very rarely see any kind of rational or calm intellectual discussion based on text. I see your signs getting pulled down. I see threats. We also know that a Muslim woman once punched you. Tell us about the reaction that you get when you try to discuss these issues. Yeah, the number of the Muslim women that have punched me has gone up to two. I had another Muslim woman a few months ago punch me in the face again and uh, actually chase me uh, to the front of one of the stores there. Uh, I was just trying to avoid her in, in the confrontation, but yeah. I'm sorry. It, I'm sorry for laughing. I'm just trying to picture a Muslim woman chasing you down the street. Yeah, basically. And uh, I try to not be physically confrontational with anyone, although like any other rational human being, there comes a point where you must exercise self-defense, but that's the last resort. I do put up with a lot of stuff like coffee thrown on me, eggs smashed in my head, my charts being torn, as you mentioned, uh, my microphone being uh, thrown at me or thrown on the floor. Uh, those are things that come with the environment. I expect that. Uh, but we can only tolerate so much before justice has to intervene. And we need to let people know that we live in a civilized society that has rules, rule of law, and that uh, violence against another person or their property cannot be tolerated. Okay, now, Lewis, uh, aside from uh, me being humored for a minute at, at the image of you being chased down the street by a Muslim woman, this is obviously a very serious issue because you're putting your life on the line, you're getting many threats. So on a very serious note here, how do you interpret this response when you are actually trying to discuss the Hadith, the Quran, the Sirah? Why this lack of intellectual engagement or you know, theological engagement from your Muslim audience and instead the, these kind of threats and uh, this kind of physical abuse? Well, I think partly it's because of the culture from which the Muslims come which is a culture that does not allow for intellectual scrutiny of the religious beliefs. And so anytime you question the religion of Islam, you're basically questioning Muhammad, which is to question Allah. And that is uh, haram, that's forbidden, it's wrong. So anytime there is any kind of light being shed on the religion that seems to imply a negativity from their perspective, mind you, they frown upon that. And instead of just giving an intellectual rebuttal, they will get, let their emotions get the better of them, and that will lead them to not give a, an intellectual argument, but to get physical. Because once you bottle up all your emotions, your feelings, and you don't express that intellectually, uh, the next step is to just deal with it violently. And that's uh, what we're trying to deal with. Uh, Lewis, I, I, I've experienced this uh, hundreds of times, I would say. Well, I don't know about hundreds of times, maybe you know, dozens of times, but in your case, I think it might get into the hundreds, if not thousands, is this particular exchange, is that uh, you're yelled at, and I've witnessed this in your case, you are yelled at for lying about Islam because it's a religion of peace, but then you get physically threatened shortly afterwards. How do the Muslims engaged in this behavior, how do they rationalize this behavior on their end? Well, I don't think they rationalize it. That's the whole problem. 
uh, that is the typical response. It's just to be angry, to get emotional, to get abusive, uh, and then get physically violent. It's like uh, different stages uh, that take place in a short amount of time. What I try to do is diffuse the situation by trying to reason with them and walk through the, the information step by step and show them that, look, I'm referencing your materials. I even get books from them, Qurans from them, and I show them in the very Qurans that they hand me. I tell them to search the websites on their smartphones or to reference them when they get home so that they're not accusing me of misrepresentation or going to a website that's specifically geared to attack or vilify Islam, but that I'm going to the website set up by Muslims for Muslims, and that's where the information comes from. Uh, Louis, before we go, there was one evening where you were talking about some of uh, the stories of what has happened, and I'd like to end on that. Uh, you had want, you, there, there had been some people you had dealt with that were Satanists. I think you might also have a story or two with the Muslims. Tell us about your message of Jesus Christ and how this has reached um, people. Some of one or two interesting stories. Sure. I, there was a group of Satanists that would come around. They would uh, yell insults, try to disrupt the situation. Uh, but by and by, they uh, started being softened because I wouldn't respond in a negative way back towards them. In fact, one time when they came by and they took a Bible, they put it in their mouth, they ripped the pages out, they started chewing some of the pages, spitting it on the ground, and I just asked them, you know, are you guys hungry? Because they were eating the Bible, basically. Um, they kind of paused and said, yeah, we're hungry. So I bought them some food. One of them came up to me afterwards, and he's like, Louis, how can we do what we're doing if you're going to be nice to us? And I said, look, that's between you and the Lord. I am to even love my enemies, something that isn't taught in Islam, that even those that persecute us, those that abuse us, we're to have love towards them. doesn't mean we endure injustices in every way, shape, or form. It means we have love towards them. And I knew that they were kids that needed uh, uh, some kind of some love. And so instead of just acting in a negative way towards them, I bought them some food. One of them came back, which was the leader of the pack, and uh, professed Christ and became a Christian. And I saw him months later. This also happened uh, with a Muslim family. Uh, the young man came to the microphone. He was uh, trying to give responses to the information I was presenting. Eventually, he realized he couldn't give a rebuttal, came to me afterwards and said, you know what, I thank you for being out here. You've made me think a lot about what I've been believing in. I'm going to listen to you some more, and we're going to go home and study. But you've given me some stuff to think about. And it's happened with different groups. Uh, a homosexual uh, came up to me and said that he understood the Bible's teachings on that and wanted a change of life to be in conformity with what the Bible teaches. Uh, this has happened with atheists. Uh, it doesn't happen in mass. I understand that. I don't expect it to. But I do hope that people will at least take the time to consider the information research that which they believe at the time so that they have an intelligent faith and make intelligent choices. I'm basically what do, what I'm doing is apologetics where I lay out all the chips on the table so that people can make an intelligent choice. Make an intelligent choice. Lewis, in the days now of ISIS arguably and, you know, terrifyingly perhaps being amongst us now in terms of San Bernardino and everything that we're seeing, are you not afraid to do what you do? Uh, I'm not afraid in the sense of uh, being fearful in Christ. All that type of fear has been taken away. People say, well, aren't you afraid they're going to kill you? Well, that would probably be the best thing that can happen to a Christian is to go home to be with the Lord. We have a faith that is solid, has a sure foundation in Jesus Christ and his gospel that says that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of the manner in which I may die. Uh, you know, it could be violent. But uh, ultimately, no, I, I'm not foolish in that I'm aware of the very real dangers. And so I do take precautions. However, I'm not fearful of the ultimate end, in that being my life, because I know where I'll be. And this is the same message I want to present to the Muslims, that they don't have to be afraid of death. They don't have to be afraid of life. They can live to the ultimate joy in Christ without the fear of death, hell, or the grave, because Christ has conquered all of that. This is something Islam doesn't offer, nor does any other worldview. And Christ rose from the dead, 
He showed us the victory that he had over the grave, over death, over sin. You are quite a man, an incredible man, a courageous man, noble man. Louis Leinhardt, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you, Jamie. We wish you the best of luck, and people should visit you, am I correct, at truthdefenders.com, right? right? Correct, yes. Louis, good luck out there, and uh, stay strong, my friend. Thank you very much. Take care. And thank you for joining the Glazov gang. Please keep in mind, we are a fan-generated show. We exist only because of you. Our lifespan is growing somewhat limited. Please help us keep going to tell the truth about the left, about Islamic supremacism, and how those two forces and ideologies are waging war on freedom on America and the West. Go to jamieglazov.com and support the show. And please subscribe to the Glazov Gang's YouTube channel. And we will see you next time on the Glazov Gang. Good night.